This is episode number 752 with Hilke Shellman, assistant professor at New York University. Welcome back to the Super Data Science Podcast. Today we've got a practical and important episode with the Emmy Award winning reporter, Hilke Shellman. Hilke's book, The Algorithm, How AI Decides Who Gets Hired, Monitored, Promoted, and Fired, and Why We Need to Fight Back Now, was published by the prestigious international publisher Hachette this month. In the exceptionally clear and well-written book, Hilke draws on exclusive information from whistleblowers, internal documents, and real-world tests to detail how many of the algorithms making high-stakes decisions are biased, racist, and do more harm than good. In addition to her new book, Hilke is also assistant professor of journalism and AI at NYU. She previously worked in journalism roles at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and Vice Media. She holds a master's in investigative reporting from Columbia. Today's episode will be accessible and probably interesting to anyone in it. Hilke details examples of specific HR technology firms that are employing misleading Theranos-like tactics. She talks about how AI can be used ethically for hiring and throughout the employment lifecycle, and what you can do to fight back if you suspect you've been disadvantaged by an automated process. All right, let's jump right into our conversation. Okay, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. This is going to be a great episode. Where are you calling in from today? I'm calling in from Brooklyn. Um, nice, Thank yeah. you for having me. My great pleasure. This is one of those things, when I have guests who are also in New York like I am, it is so much fun to actually meet in person and record. I feel like you really get to know somebody. But uh, here we are doing Next it remotely. Time. Yeah, as though you're <laughs> yeah. And maybe we should be doing a follow-up because this episode is going to be really illuminating for a lot of listeners. I'm sure we're going to have great feedback and maybe it won't be long before we need to do this again or have the pleasure of doing this again. I yeah, and I would love to have feedback. I always, uh, you know, I'm a journalist. I love feedback. Nice. Yeah. Well, uh, listeners are not shy about commenting what they think of episodes when they come out. So get out there, listeners, and uh, be sure to tag Hilke in those comments. We'd love to hear your feedback, as always. So Hilke, you are here because you had a book published this month by the prestigious Hachette publisher. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, published at least in the U.S. I'm not sure about global distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The U.K. is coming out in February. There will be a China edition. I don't know when that will be. Um, and I've heard from people all around the world that we're, ab uh, we're able to get it through at least Kindle or there's an audiobook version that yes. even if in their jurisdiction it wasn't available, they could listen to it. There's like all kinds of ways to, that's right. to find this book. So that's the beauty of having a global publisher, I guess. Yeah, and the digital ones, of course, it's easier for them to get around the world quickly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the book is called The Algorithm, How AI Decides Who Gets Hired, Monitored, Promoted, and Fired, and Why We Need to Fight Back Now. And so somebody, I think, tagged me on LinkedIn, if I remember correctly. So somebody, it must have been a listener to the podcast. I tried to uh -huh. dig this up quickly, but it's one of those things, LinkedIn is notoriously difficult to like, find things unless you can so like go back exactly. and see yeah. what happened when yeah mm -hmm. um but at some point in the last couple of months if my memory is correct a super data science listener tagged me on a post about your book coming out and said great thank you super data talk. science listener. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you should talk to Hilke and it's because they know what i do for a living and so not only is this an interesting topic for us and we've had um episodes like this in the past, talking about ethics and bias um, in algorithms, unfairness. Um, most recently, a big episode that we had on that was number 727 back in October, came out on Halloween um, with Joy Bulamwini, an amazing MIT researcher. Um, who yeah, also she really is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Popular mm -hmm. coded bias documentary. And so we had a great uh, episode on uh, related topics then, but this one, this listener, I'm pretty sure pointed out this to me specifically on LinkedIn, because this is what I am involved in for a living specifically is algorithms mm -hmm. for hiring in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you and I Hilke, talked to, about this a bit <laughs> before the episode kicked off. And uh, I, I don't want to just be talking about my company, I think probably parts of it will come up organically as we go on. But let's start by talking about the problem here. So you highlight in your book, uh, even in the prologue, you are mentioning a particular company, HireVue, uh -huh. 
as being yeah, they're one of the one of one of the largest vendors. Um, they do uh, one way video interviews. Um, for folks who don't know what that is, um, it's like uh, you know, instead of having another person in a job interview, e- either on Zoom or in person, talking to you, you just get pre-recorded uh, questions on your phone or on your desktop and you just record yourself answering, um, most of the time, probably looking into the, uh, green light and recording yourself sort of giving, I would call it more of a video presentation, but I guess people call it a one way video interview and higher view is, um, I, I would say probably by far one of the largest, uh, vendors in the space. I think, um, about a year and a half ago. So they said they just did the 30 millionth interview. Um, so lots of video interviews are going on. And it seems, if, if I'm remembering this correctly, I think that things like your book and people like Joy Bulamwini, I think there's, has there been a bit of a change now in Higher View's offering that it used yes. to be? A- so what, what happened is I started reporting um, uh, in earnest in 2018 on the, um, on sort of like AI moving into HR tech, um, you know, went to some of these um, technology company uh, conferences and I was just blown away how many hundreds of vendors and people and like I was like whoa there's a real change here and there wasn't a whole lot of journalists and like this idea that we are quantifying uh humans I was like this is really interesting like it seems humans are very complex let's see how we do this so I did I didn't want to do no more and and at the time uh higher view was still doing um uh emotion recognition um you know it wasn't technically facial recognition, because it doesn't look if it's John or Hilke, uh, the, the, the software looks at like, what are my facial expressions and what uh, emotions can be and characteristics of me can be gleaned from that. So like if I move my mouth, am I smiling? Am I happy? Those those kinds of ideas. And they also use the intonations of people's voices uh, and the words that, uh, that a job candidate used and compared it to people who've done the video interview before, who are now present in the role. So whatever facial expressions they used in the same uh, part of the job of the video interview would sort of get you in, get you more points or, or less points, I guess. Um, and so when I first saw the first presentation, I was like, wow, this seems like magic. Like we, you know, we are like, um, we can actually find if somebody is uh, well qualified for the role by checking their facial expression. That is, wow, this is like next level. And the more I started looking into it, I was like, oh, wait, like there isn't a lot of sound science underneath here. Um, so in fact, we don't know what facial expressions you need in a job interview for a given job, right? It's not even on the job. So maybe people who are in customer service need to smile a lot, but do you need to be smiling a lot in the job interview to be good? Like what facial expressions do teachers need to have? Uh, and other people, we don't actually know. Um, and then the second problem is the more I talk to um uh, folks, folks in the space on it, there is actually um, also a lot of variability in like the facial expression and the feelings underneath it, right? So the computers are very good at tracking our facial expressions. It can see that my brow is furred or that I'm smiling, but and it would infer that I'm happy, but I might not actually be happy. And in fact, uh, many times when I'm on a job interview, I've um, force smiled, uh, you know, because I'm really nervous and, and, uh, you know, a computer would have uh, figured out that I'm happy, uh, but really I'm not. So the question is like, why are we using, um, this kind of, uh, uh, predictive AI tools, um, when we, when actually the measurements are, are not scientifically sound. So I've pointed that out in like a big investigative piece in the Wall Street Journal. Drew Harwell, who was a Washington Post reporter, also had a um, uh, in-depth piece about uh, Higher View a few months later. There was a couple other, like there was an epic um, uh, in, in inquiry and I think the government started looking into Higher View and all of that sort of, I think there was a lot of pressure on Higher View and they did, um, end up dropping the uh, emotion recognition. And they did, I think about a year later, I also read in a blog post in the last paragraph that they also did drop the intonation of our voices because similar to um, uh, um, the emotion recognition software, there isn't a whole lot of um, uh, scientific evidence there that this kind of stuff works. Um, But with higher view, so they change the way they do things. Um, I sometimes compare the HR tech world a little bit to a game of whack-a-mole mm-hmm. because one company changes something and we are very glad that they did. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one, you know, there's still a few uh, folks out there or companies, vendors out there 
who um, uh, offer emotion recognition, intonation of voices. I've tested that myself in the book. Um, so, you know, you get one to close down, there's the next one, because I guess some of these um, uh, technological solutions are very easy to pull in into these tools, right? There's some sort of Python library that you can pull in and people feel like, oh, um, it's here, let's use it. Um, might solve a problem, but not understanding like, is this sound science? Am I actually doing something that's valid? And also, like, is this discriminatory or not? Is it actually uh, fair to judge people on their facial expressions, especially people who may not, uh, you know, people who have um, darker skin? Maybe the light doesn't catch them uh, in, in the same way, right? We saw this in, in gender shades. And mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole lot of uh, questions around these technologies and, and if they're fair. And that was Joy Bulamwini was specifically in that gender shades work. I was blown away by how particularly poor the intersection between being black and female was. And yeah, as we- And I can along, tell you in HR tech, not a lot of companies check for exactly the intersectionality because that's mm -hmm. often where, uh, uh, you know, both problems come, come together. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is a particular problem that the EOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission is folks is asking companies to look for, but it has not mandated it. So we haven't seen a whole lot of companies actually looking at that. They might look at just the tool, uh, let women and men roughly through at the same rates and um, different racial groups, but that doesn't look for like, do white men and like black women pass at the, as uh, somewhere of, of, of the same rate. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a real big concern in this space. Yeah, well, it's great to hear that at least some organizations, some of the big ones, like so if HireVue is the biggest video interview platform, it's good to hear that uh, you know they've made these changes, even if it is a bit of a game of whack-a-mole, something that we talk about on the show a lot, of course, uh, given that our listeners are, a huge amount of them are hands-on data science practitioners and machine learning engineers, so they know about how easy it can be to be going to a GitHub repository and downloading some open source package to do some capability and something mm -hmm. that I try to mention in the episode and probably need to be doing even more, and certainly that's what this episode is focused on, is it's thinking about how is doing that, even though the ease of getting that package into your platform may be there, what is the impact of that on your users, particularly some subgroups, and particularly people at the intersection of underrepresented groups like Yeah, like yeah. Black and women. you know, and I think I think, you know, today high of use AI, um, now looks at the words that people say um, and, and sort of makes um, uh, pr predictions based upon that. Um, and, you know, a lot of AI uh, video interview tools do that. And like one of the questions that, that, that I'm looking into is like, is that still fair? Because the mm -hmm. AI doesn't actually uh, predict on the audio of people speaking, it predicts on a transcription, like a speech to text transcription tool, right? It writes it out in words and then the computer looks at the words and, um, and uh, makes a prediction based on that. Um, but but the question is, do these transcription tools work fairly for everyone, right? What if people who have accents, people who um, speak African-American vernacular? Like we know mm -hmm. that these tools um, in the last few years when friend academics have tested them work, work not as well as for uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Caucasians who were native speakers, uh, people who have a speech impairment, right, who have a speech disability. Um, and the question if, is, if the tool doesn't capture all of their words as well, is it really fair to um, predict about how well they're qualified for the job? Um, so I think there's a lot of questions that we haven't answered um, for, for a lot of these tools in this space. For sure. And getting the words right transcribed correctly is just one part of the story. But of course, downstream in how these words are being interpreted, of course, it's even more complex. It's not just as simple as like getting the words right. It's that if somebody comes from a less common background that's being interviewed, it's it's the way that they speak, um, not just the accent, but they could be using terms of phrase that aren't comprehensible to the model or had a few examples of. And so it yeah, up... yeah. You know, they might define teamwork a little differently. And, you know, it's not based, uh, you know, the training data didn't cover that. So now they're outside of the statistical patterns. Exactly. It's a real, um, you know, there, there are so many cases that um, uh, proxy variables that speak more about like our background than actually about our job fit could come in, um, that it's really 
I mean, it's really its own science to figure out, like, how can we make sure these are non-discriminatory? Because so many easy proxies that look on its on its face, you know, as, as um, uh, psychologists in the space say, it's like facially neutral. It looks neutral. Uh, but when you dig deeper, you actually see there is a there's a whole lot of problem here. Right. Um, so what happens with companies where their whole business model is based on some kind of uh, probably spurious association between uh, some behavior and uh, higher ability. So with higher view, for example, you were able to evoke real world change um, where higher view is still able to grow and succeed as a business um, without having these emotional recognition um, or tone recognition algorithms running in the platform. Now, they do still have some potentially um, suspect AI running in there still, uh, TBD. But um, it seems maybe reasonable to say that perhaps if they if HireView didn't have maybe any AI, it's conceivable that they could still um, succeed as a company because they offer this, um, you know, this video interview service. But there are other companies out there who are in the hiring space, who are in HR tech, and who exist exclusively based on some AI models. So um, a company that was a few years ago um, lauded quite a bit was Pi Metrics. Mm-hmm. Um, so AI games, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, AI games. Um, so we see that, right? So we, so um, I talk about that AI and hiring is used in like um, very many parts of that, as we call it, the funnel, right? You have like a lot of people at the beginning and then you funnel them down to like the last, I don't know, four, five, six um, applicants that you interview. And along the funnel, you might have the the one-way video interviews that, that higher view offers, uh, or you may have AI games, as I call them, that um, that Pi Metrics um, offers. So, and you know, I should say the, the AI games, you know, it's not like a video game that we have today that is like super engaging and dramatic to play. Like this is more like early 90s aesthetic um you know there's like a balloon that you pump up i mean it's very mm-hmm. very basic. I remember the balloon. Um, uh, but you know for for um probably most uh, job applicants much more engaging than filling out 100 questions like are you the life of the party very much <laughs> Mu- you know like is that you like yeah. these are you know these are often uh, these ia games often want to find out like personality traits and sort of like um uh, personality traits and, uh, you know, some sort of job skills that might be uh, connected to the job. So the way um, Pymetrics um, used to do that, they have been bought by Harvard. Um, so, but parts of the parts of the tool are, st- are still um, um, available. And so the uh, historical Pymetrics, what, what would happen is that, um, uh, you know, they had a suite of games, I think about 12 games, and the people who are currently in the role, um, at least... Um, the company would want 50 people to play the game. And so if they are all uh, risk takers, uh, for example, if there's one of the three most important traits that come out of it um, is risk takers, they would, if applicants then play the game, uh, if you are a risk taker, you would probably get on the yes t- pile. If you're not a risk taker, as per the game, you would get on the no pile. So one of the question is, is like, well, maybe all of your accountants that have played the game that are currently in the role, the 50 that played the game, they're all risk takers. Um, good for them. But the question is like, is this just something that is unique to the accountants or is risk taking actually part of the job? So you might look for risk takers, but risk taking isn't actually part of the job. So you're looking for like, I don't know, like, uh, um, you know, something like, you know, most of the time, if you would have a, a, a a visual algorithm it would find probably people with brown hair who are you know who are currently successful so yeah you're looking for people with brown hair it might not have anything to do with the job so that's one problem the other problem is like well um risk taking in a video game is that the same as being a risk taker at work right i think a lot of us might be um you know, daredevils in a video game, but it does that actually make us risk takers in in the real world? And uh, the other question is, does do these tool actually um, uh, pull out these specific um, traits that they say they pull out? Right? We don't actually know that. Does pumping a balloon and banking the money actually measure uh, your risk taking propensities? Uh, so there's a whole lot of um, uh, problems that uh, when, I, when I've talked to experts that were like, here's why we would be very careful 
uh, with this kind of uh, AI games approach. Also, a lot of personality predictions isn't actually very, um, doesn't have a high validity for hiring. It's about five or 10% of actually success on the job is based on your personality. So putting personality front and center in your hiring process is maybe a little dubious. You might want to bring in a couple more other things to uh, to look at candidates. Um, so I think there's a whole lot of questions um, about these about these AI games. And I played one of the you know I played all of these uh, these these games, and I had different uh, uh, different strength. Um, you know, uh, you know, a few months later, I would, I would play the game again and suddenly had a different personality strength. And I'm like, that's a little weird because you're just supposed <laughs> to have a stable personality, right? right? Yeah. Um, but I think what was really um, interesting is when I played the game with um, Henry Claypool, who um, has a disability. And while we were playing it, he was sort of talking about how... Um, you know, one in one game, he, uh, he and I both had to hit the space bar as fast as possible. And he was really concerned. He was like, what if I have a motor disability um, and I can't hit this as um, as fast as possible? Um, you know, like, am I going to like be rejected because I couldn't do this? But what does hitting a space bar as fast as possible have to do with any kind of job? Um, you know, there are a whole lot of questions that come out of these. And I'm not sure if a lot of these games are calibrated for people with disability oh, um, sure. disabilities. And I think a lot of folks in HR would say like, well, but, you know, if you have a disability, you could always ask for an accommodation. Um, well, it turns out if you play an AI game, you don't actually know what is really being asked right. of you before you start. Right. So you wouldn't even really know if you needed a accommodation. Mm -hmm. And I've also now talked to enough vocational counselors that told me over and over again that their clients did need an accommodation. And they never got it. Um, so there's a lot that is uh, broken here and a lot of questions uh, to be asked how some of these tools um, are set up. Yeah, there's all kinds of these. Um, I also am aware of there's big companies out there that require tests that, I mean, this isn't really, I don't think the focus of your book is it's not exactly AI, but even when we get into more traditional like personality tests or IQ tests. It's wild to me how those are used sometimes. Um, I had a partner whose company was acquired by a private equity firm called Vista Partners. And they had a mandatory, um, everybody in the company that was acquired, including my partner, had to do a test called the CCAT. Mm. Um, and so it's this, it's an IQ test but you don't even get told how you did yet it does impact like if they're looking to do cuts your ccat score will be considered in whether you're cut or not um and so it's wild to me because it's as you say like these kinds of things like the pymetrics ai games what is the relationship between risk taking in a video game and um, risk taking in the real world well, similarly, these kinds of IQ tests where you sit and you have to pick multiple choice answers, how much is that like a real job? It says nothing about somebody's resilience and their ability to build relationships across the firm and to execute on a big project. It's like... Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, we, we, we often think about personality and I think, I think a lot of uh, uh, leaders and companies feel like, oh, I want like agile employees who not only know like the programming language that I need now, but you know, who are like, uh, have so much forethought that they're going to uh, learn the new one before it's almost even out, right? Like I need this agility. Um, but, uh, uh, you, know, you know, the question is actually like, how good are we really at measuring it? How much does it have to do with, with, uh, with the job? If you only have agile employees, they're all going to find a new job very, very quickly. Um, and then the other question is like a lot of us like can compensate, right? Like I actually, I'm actually like my personality is like, I'm actually kind of a bit shy and I had to learn to like be much more outgoing and approach people, you know, it was oh, easy wow. to do it for my job, yeah. but like, great work uh, as you seem, you know, as, like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, on the playground with my toddler, I'd be like, ah, uh, people <laughs> um and really had to overcome or in like sort of professional uh, networking settings um so i really had to overcome that but i think that speaks to it that like maybe our personality is x but a lot of us like find ways around that so i don't know how much 
uh, validity there is to this. And we've seen actually, like, for example, the disk test was in some of the AI tools that I've uh, tested that will find your personality out of your social media data exhaust, um, or they claim they can find your right. personality oh out of out of your social media uh, data yeah. exhaust. Even the disk people themselves say the disk is actually not valid for hiring. Don't use it for hiring, but somebody found uh, you know a plugin or an easy way to use it, and they built mm-hmm. a tool, and mm-hmm. um, some companies and, and recruiters now use it. Well, so. Let's flip the question around. So obviously, as we've stated so far in this episode, there's lots of ways to do things wrong in the interview process. Yet, uh, tools, as you highlight in your own book, um, online platforms like ZipRecruiter, Indeed, Monster, these have allowed huge volumes of applications to be made to even small companies Um, And the biggest firms like Google and Delta, as you've highlighted, they get millions of applications a year. Yeah, they're drowning. And so what can you do? What's the right way to do hiring? Is there a place for some kinds of tests or AI tools? Um, You know, there's lots of people like Pymetrics whole thesis was the resume doesn't work. Play these games. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of cases where that's true, but I'm sure there's also lots of other cases where a resume does provide some useful information. Yeah. Um, so, so I think like, I mean, that, that's, that's part of like the, the mission of the book that I think like, uh, human hiring is, is also very bad, right? I'm not advocating to go back to like, uh, have biased humans doing all the decision-making because that's another problem. Um, but what I'm trying to, ha- like, I have, I want to have a co- larger conversations to actually think through like what is actually works on hiring and what tools should we use that that may be less discriminatory and give us a sense of someone so, so I think I think one thing is like is like to have numerous tools um, you know have the resume but also have personality have assessment that directly look at what are the skills used in the job and can I somehow measure that can I and I think actually like some virtual reality, Applications might actually be helpful here because now with virtual reality, we could test actually people, ask them to do the job that is required and and sort of give them give also the candidate a sense of the um, of the job. I think it's still um, early. It's still hard to build these, but I think there should be um, uh, a larger uh, uh, conversation around this. I would also like tell people like I'm really open I work with a lot of sociologists and computer scientists and like I would love to have a longitudinal study where uh you know a company hires people with AI tools and maybe a traditional way and hires all of them and then we'll see over the course of of years like did the actual green labels or the red labels like did they actually perform better like was this assessment, did it actually work? Because we don't know that, right? That's sort of the the problem. We don't have these longitudinal studies and I have not found um, a company that actually tracks people they hired via AI tools um, for years to come to actually then loop back and understand, did this tool actually, was that actually predictive or not? Um, and I would love to see that because I think that would actually help companies, vendors, I think it'd be helpful to anyone, but uh, it would it, w- it would take a while um, to, to set this up and do this. But I think that would actually be a way for all of us to understand how do these tools work. Um, and I do think for folks who are in the position to buy these tools, like HR managers or, or uh, a leadership of companies, to really think skeptically, like, does this actually work? Like, what is the science underneath? Um, and um, really have outside counsel come in before using these tools to have like a pilot phase because I've heard this over and over again when I talk to employment lawyers, they um, uh, Nathaniel Glasser uh, is, is one of them. He's based in DC and they looked at an, an AI games uh, vendor. They all signed an NDA so he couldn't name the company, but he said, you know, we had a pilot phase and that tool always discriminated against women. We just couldn't get it out of it. Um, so the company didn't use the vendor, but the vendor is still around. Hopefully they've learned, but we don't know that. Um, so I think the pilot studies are good and we need a whole lot more transparency to actually sort of understand what doesn't work, uh, put that in the open. So then it forces vendors and companies to not use it and 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 change their ways. I think that's like the first step. I see. Yeah, those are great practical tips. So 
combine lots of approaches, including uh, for many kinds of roles, maybe a resume, as well as multiple assessments, uh, particularly assessments that include specific skills that are required for that Yes, job. like skills, like, you know, don't look at the school where I went to, because that tell, tells you probably more about my socioeconomic background, but actually like make sure if you need to hire people to do X, that you test for X and not for like 30 other things. Like we see this too, right? Like job descriptions are ballooning because Maybe an HR manager takes the job description from three years ago and then just adds new things that the candidate should have. And suddenly you have like 55,000 things you need. When reality, like focus on the five most important skills that you need in that role and like find those people and not anyone who happens to um, have all of the 55 skills, but maybe it's mediocre at one of them. Maybe you need somebody who is like really good at four, but the way often these tools are calibrated is that they reject um, qualified candidates. And the interesting thing is that like when people do surveys of uh, company leadership, company leadership knows that, that their AI tools or algorithms or whatever they use for hiring reject well-qualified candidates. And somehow no one is stopping this problem um, because I think the efficiency is it just it is just so needed in the industry. There's too many applications uh, coming in um, and they just need a technological solution. And they're OK with some that maybe not as good as we want them to be, <laughs> but they're just so efficient. Um, so what I'm saying is, like, I think the AI tools have proven themselves. You know, the vendors always say this is more efficient. It will save you money, labor costs. Uh, make this all faster and find the most qualified people. So it's definitely efficient. It's definitely probably saving co- money, uh, companies money. That's why they want it. But does it find the most qualified candidates? I don't think we've seen a whole lot of proof of that. Mm-hmm. Great points. All right. And then so since we have a uh, data science audience, uh, there's probably lots of listeners out there who, like we mentioned earlier in the show, they can, they're can they very familiar with going to GitHub repos downloading open source tools. Yep. And so um, I'm, I'm interested to hear what thoughts you have for what practitioners, data science practitioners, machine learning engineers can be doing, uh, product managers, business owners can be doing to try to prevent um, algorithms with biases getting into their platform. Uh, I can quickly, and maybe you can even assess <laughs> my own ideas and the kinds of things that we do at Nebula. So because we are an AI company in the HR tech space, um, we try to be careful and I'd I'd love to hear what we might be getting right or or might be getting wrong. But one of the things that we do is when we are designing our algorithms, we are thinking about different uh, groups from the start. So we're thinking Uh about uh, men and women, different uh, sociodemographic groups. Um, And so from from data collection and pre-processing all the way through, we're trying to think about um, downstream, how is this going to be used by the model? And are we potentially allowing bias to be included in the training data? I mean, I guess my question is like, it, you know, like if you have large sets of data on people, um, like how can they not be biased in there? Like a lot of these policies no. are biased. Like my hobbies are biased, show probably more For about sure. my gender and my background than, than, than other things. Um, so I think that that is a problem and i think a lot of data scientists um and, and that would be my critique for for a lot of data scientists is like they come from a big data correlation approach and like if there's a correlation that's meaningful but the question is like is it really like is it really meaningful that like um um because often it's a correlation but it's not a causation and i think that matters uh in hiring is this actually causally connected um or is this just um a random correlation and i think we've seen that in like sort of the the resume screeners right when i talk to uh employment lawyers and and uh, sort of employment lawyer adjacent folks who look at these tools who found out that the name thomas was predictive of success so i'm sure it's statistically significant it's correlation you know that that's what the tool found but we all know that Fortunately for the Thomases in the world, like your name doesn't qualify you for anything. It's your skills and, you know, all of all of all of your uh, the other things that make that. But it's, you know, statistically significant. Um, but shouldn't we be using it? Absolutely not. So I think that's that's a lot of things like we can get a lot of signals um, that we can measure. But is it actually statistically? I mean, is this is actually 
uh, significant information. You know, I've also reported on like, you know, surveillance at work that, that doc, uh, uh, I've also reported on surveillance at work and companies using, for example, uh, swipe in data uh, to check like who is longest at work and, and, and making inferences if somebody is most productive. So, so we all know just by you uh, sitting at your desk for the longest doesn't make you the most productive, right? And uh, we don't even know what it means to be most productive. But when uh, uh, that's what the company used for promotions and when they had to do layoffs during the pandemic, they also wanted to look at this data because the data was available. Um, so you suddenly have these like this beautiful data that you want to use. But actually, if you would think about it, it's a whole lot of nothing because like swipe in data doesn't isn't meaningful. And in fact, um, it might actually be discriminatory for women and people with disabilities because actually it turns out nobody has a chance to be at their desk uh, as long as they want to. Um, it can actually have just discriminatory effects because uh, uh, women are mostly caregivers and people with disabilities have the highest rates for absences and these are protective classes. Um, so I think what looks facially neutral and looks like a great correlation might actually not be um uh, um, causally connected, um, that it actually is meaningful and one uh, is connected to the other or leads to the other. Um, and then it could also have discriminatory effects. And I think we don't talk enough about that. Yeah. And there are lots of examples in your book. So uh, people might think in this episode has ended up being mostly about hiring. We don't have time to get into all the detail, but you have many chapters in your book covering different parts of the employment life cycle. So not just um, issues of AI in hiring, but also in performance, like you just went into people sitting at their desk or swiping times, um, promotion uh, algorithms or leadership training selection algorithms, layoff algorithms. Yeah, flight risk algorithms, like I'm really interested in those, like we see more and more of those, right? Or predicting who's gonna be an insider oh. threat. Um, there's all kinds of predictions that, that companies can do. And now we see it also that, um, uh, you know, um, algorithmic assessments can be part of layoff decisions. Um, um, and I'm sort of also really interested in sort of when new health and well wellness initiatives come, come, come into the workplace and sort of predictions of like, are you at uh, mental health risk? Should I give you help? And, you know, they're really interesting inferences that are, that are coming into the, the space that I think, um, yeah, I, I want to think more about that and sort of uh, the idea, what does that mean to privacy if my if my employer can make inferences if I'm anxious and depressed based on my voice that I have to use to actually talk to my colleagues, right? Like, I don't really get to opt out of that. What if they use algorithms to uh, predict that? Am I comfortable with that? Like, do I want that? There are all kinds of uh, questions coming up that um, with these new tools coming into the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's wild. There are a number of things that you could dig into. I'm sure there's tons, um, as a journalist and as an academic, uh, and as somebody who's giving lots of practical guidance, um, to actual companies out there in spaces, providing these tools or using these tools. Yeah. I mean, I still find it endlessly fascinating. I've been like, uh, you know, like looking at this for, for, for five plus years and I'm still, uh, interested, like the idea of like, how can we quantify uh, humans and like, how can we actually do uh, a good job with that and be uh, uh, fair and don't discriminate um, and actually use tools that are valid. I mean, I think it's like a never ending um, interest of mine. So I'm going to continue down this road. And I'm always interested in like hearing from folks, talking to folks and, um, uh, you know, looking at the interesting stuff that, that works, that doesn't work. Like I'm not against tools that work. <laughs> in fact, I have a couple in the book that I highlight where I think like, oh, that might be an interesting application. Um, but, you know, I do really think like if we want to do um, AI tools in the world of work right, we got to ensure that they work and uh, that they don't discriminate. So I do think that this is like a necessary first step um, to make these tools better. And with more and more AI, more and more data collection, it's going to be increasingly important. Like not only, it's a good thing, <laughs> that you find this interesting because we're going to have an accelerating pace of platforms and companies that are doing AI things in employment. And, and so back to uh, a few minutes back to the question that I had about what our listeners as data scientists or ML engineering um, experts could do. Um, I started talking about, um, you know, 
being thoughtful about your data collection and your modeling from the very beginning and how this might impact people downstream, that's probably not a bad idea. You reminded me how important it would be because even no matter how thoughtful we are about removing explicit things like people's names, so issues like Thomas coming in there, you could still end up with um, implicit biases getting in. So things like interpretable machine learning are probably important, um, as are things like testing afterward. So um, the four fifths rule, for example, that you talked about from the EEOC. Yeah, and also like, um, like you know, I, I sometimes come up with edge cases that I that that I test myself and see like, well, if you like get an applicant like this, uh, what what would happen? Um, and I think we need a whole lot of more of that, and we need um, uh, a whole lot of more people who are diverse to build these tools, but to also test these tools, right? Like I really have, um, and there's a whole chapter in the book devoted to people with disabilities. And, um, you know, and I'm not sure how to square that round because a lot of people with disabilities, uh, first of all, they're underrepresented in the workplace. So probably a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, their personality traits and, 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 and their uh, uh, skills and, and how they do work might not be represented in the training data. And then the problem is also a lot of their disabilities are, are so in individually, right? Like, you know, I might be autistic and somebody else might also be autistic, but uh, my disability might uh, uh, manifest itself so differently than from somebody else. So even if somebody else in the training data it might not actually uh, cover the way my disability is expressed. Like, um, so like it's such an individual thing and having a one size fits all algorithm is just not very clear to me how that is going to work. And we don't want to leave um, folks who are already marginalized, who are already up underrepresented in the dust. So I think there needs to be a whole lot more testing and uh, thinking through this before bringing the products to market. And not, you know, I think we're pretty good on like race and gender. Um, uh, thinking about that, there's still problems coming up with that. But I think like uh, people, you know, you mentioned intersectionality, very important people with disabilities. Um, we haven't talked a whole lot about age um, and how that is affected by the algorithm, by algorithms that we use. So I think there's a whole lot more testing and thinking through out there. Um, and, and, and truthfully, I think often companies don't have the time. They have to go to market. They don't have the luxury of use of scientific research. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 Uh, so really great points there. Just quickly getting through them, um, trying to remove data that could be um, that could be biased from the data because we can't be sure that we get that all right, or there could be implicit biases, having interpretable machine learning um, in there, having diverse people building these tools and testing these tools um, is critical. And then uh, my last one here is that testing afterward once the algorithm is developed, um, so not just the main effects, not just making sure that the main effects um, are not having bias, but the intersections too. Um, yeah, and always test, even if you think this is like totally facially neutral. Like I talked to uh, a former director or a senior acquisitions folks of one of the largest companies in the United States. And he said that they found out if somebody has a friend in the workplace, they would stay longer at the company. So they wanted, you know, wanted to build out retention. Um, but when they actually looked at the results, they found out that um, this was overrepresentative for Asian Americans and African-Americans um, had way less people at the workplace. Um, so it was actually discriminatory. But you would think like, well, if you have like, well, you know, an acquaintance or, or a friend at, at, at the work site, that's great. Like you stay longer. It's a great predictor of success. Let's find people who know someone. Well, it turns out like there's only like certain sections of the population, um, uh, you know, have a higher percentage of people they know. So it's actually like a discrimination through through the back door if you don't keep on testing and looking at this. And I think a lot of times we'll be like, oh, this sounds like a great criterion, right? It's it's um, it's predictive. Yeah, it is. But should we use it? No. Um, so I think those are kind of examples where I want to get people to really start thinking and skeptically um, uh, looking at these tools. And so last uh, technical question for you here before I let you go, and you've been very generous with your time. We're, we're, <laughs> I've taken up more of your time than I said we would already. So thank you so much. But uh, last thing is, so if our listeners, if we have a listener out there who suspects or knows that they have been impacted, uh, perhaps adversely 
buy an AI tool or some other kind of evaluation yeah. uh, at some point in their employment process, what should they do? They should call an employment lawyer and me and possibly call the EOC uh, to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who are all tasked with uh, looking into this. Like, um, uh, I think it's it's a little bit difficult in the United States and, and in most jurisdictions because you have to show that you were harmed um, by a tool. So, I mean, we all get rejected from uh, from. Um, applying for a job all the time. So do I know why I was rejected? So it's really hard to have that, um, uh, to to show that you have evidence of, of that um, unfair rejection. Um, I think what might be helpful, I've seen people who have like um, recorded uh, some of the assessments who've asked for their data from companies, but very easy under GDPR uh, in, in, in Europe. And I think there's some consumer laws in, in California that will also allow people to do that soon. So I think those might give you hints, but you know, there is a little bit of a, of a growing um, uh, chorus of people who want, um, you know, if you see design features that are problematic. So the EOC, for example, find a company that had, uh, made people put the ages into, um, uh, you know, whatever uh, template they had on their website. Um, so a woman put in 55 and then younger and older, and she was rejected when she was older and not when she was younger, and she brought a case to the EOC. So by the design choice already gave you a hint that there might be a problem. Um, so those are one of the cases. So I think people want to see like, okay, let's see if we can, um, if you find a design feature, that's possibly problematic. Maybe we should l let a case come through, but right now, that's not the case. So it's very difficult to um, to actually bring a claim. So the more we need to rely on whistleblowers, employment lawyers who are in this space, who will like hopefully speak up and tell us when they find problems, because that's the only way the industry will get better. And I know that everyone in the industry also does want to hire people fairly. I know no one sits there and wants to discriminate, right? It's just like a matter of like, if we use um, these kinds of AI tools, we need to make sure uh, they work. And that is a very, very hard task to do and don't discriminate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, lots of great guidance there for data science practitioners, as well as anyone who thinks they may be impacted by these AI tools in the employment process. Hilke, before I let you go, I always get, ask guests for a book recommendation. Of course, we have your own brand new, The Algorithm, which people should be checking out. Uh, but do you have another recommendation for us as well? I do. And I think it's like slightly off the beaten uh, track. One of the books that has uh, um, touched me the most is actually The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, uh, Wilkerson that is uh, about the Great Migration to uh, the north of the United States. Um, it's actually beautifully written, and I've never cried reading a nonfiction book. And at the end, I was so sad and I cried. Oh wow! Um, that was a very powerful book that really has nothing to do with AI, but with like the love of humanity. Um, and um, I think it was just like a beautiful, human spirited book. So um, I, I like how you, you kind of just in, I like how you just indirectly said there that AI has nothing to do with love of humanity. That's that's. <laughs> I think, look, I, I think it can actually um, uh, help us a lot. Like, you know, there was a, you know, there there was a reason why almost six years ago I started investigating, actually it's been six years, I started investigating this because I love the idea of AI. I think it's like a transformational technology. Clearly, it's like fascinating. Just have to do it the right way. Yeah, that is the key thing that um, that can come out of all this is that we know that humans make terribly biased decisions and are so much more likely uh, to, for example, pick people that look like themselves for a role. And so there is a huge opportunity here with technology, with AI uh, in particular, to undo some of those issues as opposed to propagate them and um, and just make them reinforced. Yeah. So uh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Hilke, for coming on and giving us so much of your time in today's episode. Yeah, really well, thank you for it. having me. As you can tell, yeah. I love talking about this topic. I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated. So yeah. I'm, um, thank you all for listening. Yeah, it was a really fun episode. How should people follow you uh, after today's episode or get in touch? You know what? The easiest way is like LinkedIn. Um, there's only one Hilke Shellman, So find me on LinkedIn. I also have a website. Um, but, uh, you know, we all kind of uh, left Twitter. So um, I think LinkedIn is like 
maybe the new Twitter for the world of work. <laughs> Not does. sure. It seems <laughs> we'll to see. be by default with people yeah. are ending up. Uh, for um, lots of people now. Nice. All right. Thank you so much, Hilke. And we'll be catching you again soon, maybe for an in-person episode. I hope so. Thank you, John. Lots of food for thought in today's episode. In it, Hilke covered how AI-driven processes like higher views, emotion recognition, and Pymetrics AI games can do more harm than good during the hiring process. She talked about how combining resumes with a suite of assessments, including assessments that cover skills that are specifically required in the role, can provide a more holistic snapshot of a job applicant. And she talked about how data scientists can curate their training data and modeling approach carefully while using interpretable ML approaches, diverse builders, diverse testers, and tests of both main and interaction effects to not only minimize the negative impact of AI in decision-making, but potentially make a positive societal impact with AI. All right, that's it for today's episode. If you enjoyed it, consider supporting the show by sharing, by reviewing, by subscribing, but most importantly, we hope you just keep on listening. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.